I can't read this. It's going by so it's fast. But this is the projects. Robert Taylor House of Construction was completed in 1962. And the film you're about to see was made two years later. At the time, this was the largest public housing development in America with 28 high-rise buildings. Dang. In 1964, apartments were in decline. By 1964, it was two over. years. God damn, man. What the fuck? How? Perpetually broken elevators, the Mickey Cobras and Black Disciples gang dominated the projects in 45,000 and drug deals took place daily. 95% of the 27,000 residents were unemployed. About 96%. Like that movie, uh, New Jack City. About 96% were African Americans. And the majority of the residents had a family member in prison. Yikes. <laughs> Godly. Earlene White is a Chicago housewife, mother of six children. Before urban renewal, she lived in a slum. Now she inhabits a new world. A world of concrete and glass. It is clean and free of rats. Her new home has heat in the winter and rows of open galleries to catch the summer breeze. She got a baseball bat. You see that? You see the baseball bat? Like sticking many out other of residents of Robert. Look. Look at the baseball bat sticking out the groceries. God, that's wow. That's wow. Like many other residents of Robert Taylor Homes, Mrs. White knows that the project is physically a vast improvement over the slums. Yet, like other tenants, she feels that within the project's great high rise buildings, she is struggling with a new enemy. Anyone that is paying in the high rise projects and looking in from the outside, it seems like a beautiful home, a clean home, and another place to live in. But I live inside of a high rise in Chicago, and I know the atmosphere that I am living in. There's so many people in the high rise, and there are 10 families to a floor. There are 154 to 56 families to one building. To each family, there are from two to ten children. You go out to get groceries, you come from two to ten children. Them niggas was fucking like rabbits back then. Children. You go out to get groceries, you come up on the elevator. You have to wait 10, 15, 20 minutes before you can get it. You gotta wait 10, 15, 20 minutes to get on the fucking elevator. Shout out to Doug Chunks. He says, coming soon, my new channel, Walk Nation News. <laughs> Salute. Yeah, man. It's a, yeah, man. Go ahead and do your thing, man. Be like um 22 Savage, man. With this many people around, when the mornings you wake up, there's children up and down the gallery with the noise, knocking on your door, a couple of neighbors arguing on the gallery. At night when you go to bed, it's the same thing. You feel that it's too many families involved, too many faces that you see. You can't go in or out of the building unless you're looking into many faces. You can't go to the shoe to empty your garbage unless there's a million faces in front of you. <laughs> He's tired of seeing these Negro faces. <laughs> I am. <laughs> right. I don't blame her. Right. Because you know how niggas is. I don't know if Gladys noted, but niggas always looking at you. Niggas act like they never seen a human being before every time they see you and shit. Especially the younger ones. The younger they and you are. Not, and you better not look at us the wrong way either. <laughs> yeah, it's just weird. It's just every time you look at a nigga, it could be like a fucking argument or some kind of like situation. And I wonder who are my children's playing with? Who are they friends? 
I wonder if I can raise my boys and girls here and they can turn out to be the type of children and young men and ladies that I have always dreamed and hoped and prayed for them to be. You can't hang your pictures like you want to. The walls are rough. You still can't paint them what you want to paint them. Someone would think that living in a high-rise building with this menace family that is involved, that you wouldn't be lonely. But I feel living in a high-rise building like this, that you are very much alone. It makes me feel as if this is not my home. This is only a place where I sleep and pay my rent. It's just like your clothes in a corner with no way out, nowhere to go. That's some real shit. The chairman of the Housing Authority is Charles Swibel. We at the Chicago Housing Authority have interpreted the rules and regulations in regard to public housing to mean that we are to provide safe, decent, decent and sanitary housing, which means good housing, but not luxurious housing. Some of the individual complaints that I, as well as the people on the outside have heard about the people, the residents not being able to paint walls, not being able to hang pictures on the walls, are a slight over-exaggeration. We do give our tenants now a choice of five colors. This is an evolution. You must remember that these people have come out of slums. They have brought with them some of the slum bred ideas some of the slumbered hostilities in regard to hanging a picture on the wall. All we ask of them is that they notify the manager so we can give them the proper hook. We don't want to make it so comfortable and so ideal for them that they wish to remain in public housing. We are trying to... You heard that? Yep. Don't get too comfortable, my niggas. It is real shit. That price. Real shit. Still living that motherfucker to the day that was the, around that time. I guess I think gliders fundamentally make the same mistake over and over again. They think that other people think like them. And the way the sun mind works, the way my mind works. Okay, you're giving me a house, an apartment. But only for a little bit, and then I gotta go work and pay market rate rent for my own. Fuck that! I just stay here forever. Right. <laughs> and it got some some people that's proud of it because I know mad people from the projects that till this day, like you said, from back in the days that they still on that shit. They be proud, like man, my grandmother and my people been in projects since back in the day, like yeah. 30, 40 years. We man, we been in projects all this time. That's a shame, bro. That's sad. That's a huge thing if you're black to be from the projects. Being from the projects is as a black person is like being from like um like uh, an exclusive upper crust neighborhood if you're white. It's it's the exact opposite. Yeah. Like the the gravitas and the um prestige that comes from being from the projects in the black community. Is 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 it's just unparalleled, man. Um, to get them upgraded, if you will, so that they they can go out on the open market and find private housing. If I had a choice of living at Robert Taylor Homes or in a dilapidated shack, I would choose Robert Taylor Homes. When I visit my mother in what some people may call a slum area. I feel this is home, not because it's my mother's home, but it's because I feel free. I've left behind me the noise. I left behind me the hundreds of children. I left behind me these stone walls closed in on you. When I go there, I can sit on a porch or my kids can go in the yard and play. I can open a door. Yeah, but then you got this woman and her six kids moving in your neighborhood. And it's like, yeah, you got a better situation than you had in the projects, but now the neighborhood is fucked because you, some black woman and six kids just moved in. And, and that's why Gladys didn't want us in the neighborhood. 
<laughs> You're right. No, serious. No, serious. That's why Gladys and like when when those old videos that we used to watch when Gladys used to have the cops there and dogs. And all, that was just because we was trying to move into their fucking neighborhood. That's all that was and shit. We was yeah. trying to move in. The they was trying to have that shit. Yeah, nobody wants this, and, and nobody wants that. She could be the nicest woman in the world, but her fucking six kids, yikes. I come inside and eat. These little small things is really what matters. <laughs> we do want them to better themselves. That is the sole purpose of the public housing program. We want their morale to go up. We hope and pray that they can merely use public housing for an economic reason and that they will better themselves, make get better jobs, make more money, and go into the private market. We are not in competition with the private market. I just don't understand. In the early 90s, the buildings were destroyed. Nearby streets were covered with litter, and neighborhoods lacked any banks or grocery stores. So residents travel far to buy basic goods and staples. So when 95% of the people were unemployed in 62, I mean 64, in the 90s, 97% of the tenants were unemployed. In 93, after maintenance work was beaten to death by gang members for allowing police access to the building where a gang meeting was taking place, it was decided to replace the buildings with low-rise buildings. <laughs> Holy shit. I'm telling you, man. You you it it's you, you just can't do anything with these people, man. They're 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 beyond you can't help them, man. That's that's this, and I know that it's it's. I get it, man. It's it's not pleasant. Like, when why can't we? Hope? I I get it, man. I do, man. I really do, man. I get it. We should be able to help them. We can't. Channel Two Investigation has found that the Chicago Housing Authority wasted millions of dollars on low-income housing that was never finished. It was part of a court-ordered program to de-emphasize high-rise projects and instead fix up smaller buildings on sites scattered throughout the city. But the Channel 2 investigative team has found that the CHA has turned scattered sites into scattered slums. Tonight, Pam Zekman reports on why the largest contracts awarded in the program have become the CHA's biggest failures. This is the only heat in Edna Warfield's Southside apartment. Conditions are so bad that she and her three children desperately want to move into public yeah. housing. They're among thousands of families on the waiting list. All I want is some heat. I am tired of being cold. Each night, the family goes to sleep afraid that their apartment... That's a rough-looking... These are rough-looking sisters. <laughs> With the strong jerry curls in that family. Conditions are so bad that she and her three children desperately want to move into public housing. They're among thousands of families on the waiting list. All I want is some heat. I am tired of being cold. Each night, the family goes to sleep afraid that their apartment will catch on fire. I hope God don't know does the stove or nothing don't explode while we laying up that sleep. If anybody got anybody got any kind of feeling out there. If they got a partner that I can't pay, let me know. Please. About a mile away from the war fields, these CHA row houses have been sitting vacant and boarded up for years. They're part of two contracts to build or renovate 234 apartments scattered around the city, homes that poor people could be living in. Most of the apartments were never finished, and the $8 million budget is now gone. CHA records show that one reason why the money's gone is the agency paid for work that was not done. In this six flat, the agency paid $2,000 for new hardware. It was never installed. 
paid $3,000 for all the plastering. It was not all done. Paid $10,000 for rough carpentry. It wasn't finished. In fact, work in two of the six apartments was never even started. The contractor was Gerald Cantor, president of Industrial Structures Incorporated, ISI. Cantor was hired by the CHA despite his bad track record with the agency. In 1981, the CHA staff said the quality of his previous work was very unsatisfactory. They would not recommend hiring the company again. But four months later, the CHA hired Cantor anyway. They gave him the scattered sites contract because Cantor was the low bidder. Now the CHA is trying to undo the damage. Here, the circuit breaker panel was installed without a cover, leaving live wires exposed. At other buildings, electrical outlets were not properly installed. And at this building, the electrician used the wrong wire. It's not heavy enough for the current. It's just sloppy, sloppy workmanship, carelessness. That can result in what? Well, it can result in the fire and the loss of property and more importantly, the loss of life. In several buildings, the plumbers damaged important support beams when they cut them to install pipes. The CHA later hired another contractor to repair the weakened beams. In this apartment, the tenants have to use kerosene heaters to stay warm. Cold air blows in through gaps in the walls, and the back door doesn't fit properly. You can see daylight where there's a big space. An important vent for the furnace was supposed to be installed in this hallway, but the contractor put it in a bedroom where it's blocked by the door. It's very cold in here. Like I said, we all have to stay in one room, you know, to keep warm. The contractor, Gerald Cantor, says the construction problems were the result of poor planning by the CHA. He says if the CHA had any complaints about the quality of the work, they should have notified him. And he denies getting paid for work that was not done. The only thing that we were paid is specifically is for the work that CHA inspectors approved. Our investigation found that this construction project was doomed from the beginning. The plans drawn by CHA architects were often incomplete and led to cost overruns. Sometimes the blueprints even called for work that violated city building codes. Take this one building, for example. There was no provision to comply with the fire code when the enclosed back porch was made into a bedroom. The building's main plumbing line was too small to provide enough water and the plans called for glass blocks in the basement windows. Building inspectors say they seal the room so tightly that it can cut off air needed for the safe operation of the furnace. The problem is that the people will be asphyxiated with carbon monoxide poisoning. By August of 84, the CHA had spent three-fourths of the budget, but only one-fourth of the apartments were finished. The CHA canceled its contract with ISI, but the problems got even worse. Most of the building... Do you feel sorry for those people? Hell no. Why not? Because my grandmother's always telling me, like, a situation like this, like, I'm not downing you for being in a situation like this, but you're supposed to pick yourself up and get up out of situations like this. It's supposed to be like a pit stop. It's not supposed to be for like forever. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't feel sorry. I mean, I'm I'm sure the if they're giving you a free house, it's not going to be like the greatest thing in the world if it, if they're giving it to you for free. Um, where are the men in the community, like these are minor repairs. Where's where's a group of men from the community just going around and doing those repairs? These minor repairs. Come on, Ark. You talked about before, even when some people have houses, we don't do repairs on our own houses. Our shit be falling apart and all types of crazy dangerous. Shit. These are minor repairs. Like you could have a um you have a group of men even get paid, like go around and do it for like, you know, handyman type shit. Do it for fucking couple bucks. It's crazy, man. Um, 